Um, thanks everybody for coming. I know for some of you and us, it's late on a Friday evening, but we made it. So I wanted to talk about uh, kind of a, an aha moment that I had about 15 years ago um, that honestly in retrospect seems almost trivial and yet I don't see a lot of people doing it. So first, just as a little bit of background, I teach economics and I'm fortunate to teach a class called Game Theory. For those that aren't familiar, it's the science of strategic interaction. So we teach everything about why firms collude or don't collude to why some students free ride in group projects to how much should you bet in Final Jeopardy. To all of it kind of the idea of how do you do the best possible for yourself given the actions of others. The good news is it sounds like a fun class. It's got the word game right in the title. Uh, the bad news is it is a class of theory and economics. And so there's a lot of monotony and a lot of math. And so the balance challenge has always been how to balance the intuition, the fun side, with the fact that there's a lot of theoretical stuff to get through, which in economics is often mathematical, though also can be conceptual or in other fields there's always kind of this material you have to get through that perhaps isn't the most fun part. So what I wanted to do is take you through how I learned to teach and what modifications I made along the way in order to get to what I wanted to talk to you about today. So originally I was taught that the standard lecture starts with kind of a big example to motivate and get everybody excited and then you get into the theory and then you move on. And so come in and I can talk about a big example. And so I figured, why not pick something really grand? Like we have two nations that have nuclear weapons that hate each other. How do we keep them from blowing each other up? So hopefully don't really need something that grand, but something the students go, wow, I'm gonna learn just that today. And then I switch over to the board and start scribbling a lot of math and explaining all of this theory. Students ask, wait, how does this solve the thing we started with? I say, just, just wait, just trust me, we'll get there eventually. At some point, you have a classroom that looks something like this. And then the question is, how do you bring it all back? And my first teaching mentor was a very cynical person and basically described that the way you solve this is through this figurative idea of literally what he called the shiny ball. And so, basically said you come to class armed with little shiny balls that you can kind of shake and throw and the students get really excited and then they think they've done something and then they come back for attention and you can teach more. And so these are the one minute video presentation or the joke or the story or something that happened on campus yesterday or some other kind of thing that lets the students think for a little bit and interact for a bit and not stare at a lecture. And so my first few years of teaching was really just devoted to how do I bring in a few more shiny balls and throw them around other parts of the lecture. And then eventually the last shiny ball became games. After all, students show up to a class on game theory and they expect some of these. And so the last 10 minutes of each class would be some sort of an interactive decision where if you wanna think about Final Jeopardy, imagine you need to place your bets how much would you bet? Well, you need to think about how much others are gonna bet. You need to think about how much others think you're gonna bet. And you keep doing that until your brain explodes. And so you do these kinds of little games, you talk about the games and then the students leave incredibly happy because they just did this fun demonstration thing. So I ran into a few issues. Overall lectures were going well, but I wasn't happy with a few things that range from pedagogical to just my own personality. So the first that I found is I spent a lot of time in lecture on suspension of disbelief. So students would say, but wait a second, what about? And I would say, you know, just give me a chance, wait for that. I'll make that all come together at the end. Until I actually came to a point where I took it as a challenge that every time I had to say, wait for it or let me get to that was a failure in some sense of what I'm doing. That, that it meant that I wasn't putting things in the right order for the students if they're not yet convinced. My other issue was that I found these games are things that made the students happy when they left class, but I never really felt like they had a chance to fully reflect on what they did and why. Usually these games, you make a decision, we debrief quickly, we show you what happened, 
You're supposed to take away something from that, but there's never a chance for the person to kind of organically reflect on what they did and how and why it turned out that way. Um, two other issues I had. One, I'm a control freak. The idea of leaving these games to the unknown meant, first of all, I had no idea how long they would take. Some of them run in five minutes. Sometimes you get a class that's slower and it takes 15. And that just didn't sit well with well, my personality. And the last issue is sometimes when these simulations don't go quite right, when people don't do what you expect them to do, I always found regretting afterwards not having thought of the perfect teaching moment that I could have used that for. Meaning only later did I come up with, ah, that one person that did this weird thing, here's what I should have done with that in the context of the class. So those are the four problems that I faced that I tried to solve. And I did so through about three years of learning. And so this is my entire point of today. The rest is just you know, animation detail and shiny balls. So the first was, I had the thought that why am I doing these games at the end as a demonstration of what the students learned? Instead, what I started realizing is economics is a social science, or at least used to be. We're supposed to predict what people do, or at least that's what we claim. And so why do we need people to learn the theory before they act it out? After all, we're not predicting the behavior of economists, we're predicting the behavior of people, of which students are a representative. And so I started each class by having the game first, before they even knew what the lecture or the game was about. I would just say, here's a situation, let's do stuff. And they would say, wait, what's the point? What are we trying to learn? And I would say, just go ahead and make decisions. What I found then is that, and this is the part that, that I'll tell you really surprised me. People come into a class called game theory, they expect really complicated, fun, involved games with lots of moving pieces. I found that to be really tough to teach because the more moving pieces, the less students focused on what I was hoping they would get out of it and the more they were in the weeds with all the little details, the institutional issues of exactly how this interaction is supposed to work. And so every time that I thought about a new game that I would use, and I'll show you what I mean by that, I would make them simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler until the students were asked a very specific thing that didn't have lots of moving parts or imagination. But then here was the big one. The issue that I had was that I really felt that students needed to reflect on what they're doing, not in class, but on their own. And so the distance it really suggests that what I started to do is have them play the very same games I used to have in class two, three days before they come to lecture. So at first I did them over email. Now I have a, an online system that runs it where students would log in on their own time, participate in a simple, silly game that has an interactive component, they don't get to see the resolution of that until they actually come to class. But they have two or three days to kind of sit with the decision that they made. What this ended up doing, what I'll talk about quite a bit today, is they actually come to class ready to talk about two different things. The decision they made and the decision they wish they made. That is, after playing the game, after making a silly decision, they all, because I don't tell them to, actually think about it. Some of them even talk about it to other students. And when they come to class, they have not only figured out what they did and why, they've already done half of the teaching for me. In some sense, they've already processed the idea of the question or the situation in a way that allows me to kind of take that intuition. And then all I'm doing in class is just showing them the tools to apply it to bigger, uglier problems. And so that's what I want to talk about. Really what I just want to do is just show you the first two games that I use in my class. I, I'll tell you before we do that, that the simplify it part terrified me. The simpler I made them, the more I thought the students are going to find this silly. They're going to find this not as worthy of what they're coming to class for, big complicated games. And yet, as simple as they are, this is the part of the class that the students absolutely love. Uh, I've taught this uh, at a couple of universities, MBAs, undergrads, executives. All of them find this to be the most fun part. And I always feel like I'm getting away with something because it's just so easy. 
So let me give you, oh, I was supposed to do that. See, cool animations that I forgot were here. So here, so I get credit for them. Look at that. So here's the, the first topic I teach. The, before I get to any of the hard game theory stuff, there's really just two main lessons I want the students to get. And the first one of them is avoid the easy, obvious answer. Right. Whenever you see a problem, there's an obvious incentive answer. There's this kind of something that's pretty straightforward. But if you move past that, if you say, I'm not done thinking yet, let me, let me take it one step further beyond the obvious answer. And so Wayne Gretzky explained that about the way that he played hockey. He said, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate the puck to where it's going to be. And so the first part of this class is teaching them to predict how things are going to unfold rather than just reacting to the net. So I'll start with the shiny ball. I spent a long time on this on class, but I'll just spend just a few minutes. So one of the things that I ask them, for example, to kind of make this point, um, most of the university students are very aware about the policy that if you have a child under the age of two, you do not need to buy them a child seat. I mean, right, they can sit in your lap instead of having their own seat on an airplane. The reason they're aware is because as young adults, they all hate the idea of kids on a flight and even more so when they're sitting next to a parent with a kid in the lap. And so I asked them this question. I say, you know, you're required to stow your purse or your computer or any other belongings because those two pound, those two pound belongings in case of turbulence become projectiles and they can hurt other people on the plane. But a 15 pound baby, apparently that's okay. And that seems strange. And so do you think that this is good for the children? Do you think children are safer in a parent's lap in case of turbulence? Or do you think they would be safer if they were required to be in a safety harness in their own seat? So I ask the students this. About 80% of them say in a safety harness. There's always 20% that says, actually, I think the children are safer in a parent's lap. I always find that interesting. They say things like, well, parents love their child, so they won't let go. Safety seats have absolutely no feeling for the child, but they usually don't let go either. But weirdly enough, believe it or not, about 25 years ago, the Federal Aviation Administration spent $6 million testing this question. They built these platforms. They put dummy parents and dummy children on them that had the tension that a human being would have. They shook the platforms to simulate turbulence, and they saw what happened. And they found, not surprisingly, children experienced less shock in a safety seat than in a parent's lap. So then we talk about why haven't we banned it then? Why, who in the world is in favor of still having this policy? And they give economics answers. These people don't want to lose money. These people don't want to lose money and so on. And then I ask them, well, what about if all you care about is the children? You want to save the children. You don't care about money. You just want to save the children. Should we allow kids to sit in their parents' laps, given the science of what I just told you? Ironically, it was a bunch of economists that wrote a paper 25 years ago that said, if you want to save children, do not change this policy. And the weird reason is, once a kid is on a plane, they are much safer in a child safety seat than in the parent's lap. But you have to take it a step further. Would kids be on the plane in the first place? And if you doubled the price of, tra of travel for parents who are already a price sensitive group, if you made them buy an extra seat, a lot of them won't fly. So what would they do instead? They would drive. And so the real question then is, are kids safer in, a, in the back of a car on America's highways or in their parents' lap on an airplane? And that's not even a question. Kids are safer running up and down the wing of an airplane than they are for a couple of hundred miles on America's highways, right? And so this, you know, is the shiny ball that says that the, the answer, the obvious answer seems like, well, if you want to protect children, you shouldn't let them sit in a parent's lap. But if you take it a step further and realize that by changing that, you're going to change the incentives, then they start to see this. But it's a hard sell in a 20, 30 minute kind of part of a class to really get them to appreciate that. So what I do instead, is I have them play games. So the two games I'm gonna talk about today, one of them, if anybody here is an economist or has taken an econ class, you probably know, which is fine, because I'll just show you how moving the game in time where you do it res with respect to the material is gonna have an impact. And the second, you probably don't. 
here is all I tell the students. So beforehand I say, every week you are going to log on in online and you're gonna play a game. They say, well, what's the game like? So it's a game. And they desperately wanna know, like, what does it mean? How does it work? And I say, it's a game. Basically, they know about as much as you do. You showed up to the section, you're thinking, oh, wow, we're going to talk a lot about really complicated games, because why else would you have the word game twice in the title? The students are all having the same anticipation, and I tell them, you're going to play a game. A couple more things. It won't count towards your grade, meaning each game will give you a decision. The decision will translate into some rewards, points, dollars, whatever unit might be there. How it translates will depend on the game. It might depend on what other people do. It might depend on luck. But how well you do in a game does not matter for your grade. It does matter because we're going to talk about it in class. I'm going to put your name up on a slide and ask you, why did you do this? But aside from that, it won't matter for your grade. I also tell them there's a time limit. Every one of these games, as soon as you log in, you'll have 15 minutes to play. And I say the reason for that is I don't want you to spend a lot of time on these. Remember, the idea is to find out how people behave, how people think. I don't want them to spend too much time on it, primarily because I want them to go, oh, that was a bad decision after they played, not during. And I don't want them to log into the game and then start doing research. I just want them to think and do what feels right. So I tell them the reason for the time limit isn't to raise anxiety. That's just an extra benefit. And good luck. So this is literally all they're told. So now imagine it's time for you all to play the first game. So I, as I said, I used to do these when I first started, I did these over email. I would just literally email them and say, here's the thing I want you to consider, email me back your answer. That was annoying, it worked, but it was annoying how to keep track of emails and kind of, then later I just, uh, I put the, the decision onto uh, Blackboard. So that's much easier to figure out what people did, but I still had to, in some sense, tabulate from their Blackboard scores manually. When I realized I would be doing this and teaching this class a lot, I invested a, a couple of months to just kind of program up a very simple system of my own, primarily because on the back end, it does all of the math for me and just spits out basically the slides that I use to debrief. So it was a big kind of one-time investment, but honestly, just doing this as a survey in Blackboard worked fine for me for, for a couple of years. So they show up to this, game one, put in your username and your password. Okay. Once you do that, you see at the top of the screen, the fact that you have 15 minutes to complete this, to make it really obvious, there's the blue countdown timer. It's not actually counting down, but it would. And tells them that there's a, a one minute warning. So it would pop up a thing that says, you really might wanna put an answer in soon. Okay, here's what I need you all to do before I show you the game. As I said, some of you have probably seen it, others haven't. So make sure you can't see your chat box. For now, what I want you to do is just kind of see the question, think about it, and then once you have an answer, go to the chat box and just type it in. So in other words, obviously, you'd see what everybody else did. So there's a half second of honesty required. So here's the game. You will select a number between 0 and 100. Yep, that's it. Here you are going, I can't wait to see what the game is. Pick a number between 0 and 100. The person in the class who's closest to 3 quarters of the class average wins. In other words, specifically, I will take the average of all the choices that all of you give, and I'm gonna multiply it by 0.75. That's the magic number. Whoever's closest to that number is the winner. That's it. So the rest of it just tells you how many points you get. What are points? They're nothing, They're meaningless. The winner gets points. The next person gets less points. So you need to pick a number, and if you're closest to three quarters of the average of the numbers, you win. So then the students simply see this, where they would type in a number and hit submit. So now it's your turn. So spend a few seconds, think about the number, and just throw it into chat. Okay. So I'm gonna need Patty, Evangeline, Angela.
So what I'll tell you about this, I see quite a few of you, so I'll give you another second if you haven't yet put it in. Um, outside of people that have seen the game, this is a game that gives you the exact same results no matter who you do it with. You can do it with your third graders, um, or as I've done it, you can do it with CEOs of companies, you can do it with MBAs, you can do it with undergrads, as long as you have a group of more than 30 people, and I'm not gonna do all the math here, but you pretty much always get the same results. So let me ask if I can, a couple of people to just briefly tell us what they did. Um, okay, so here's one that's, how about Patty? If, if, if is Patty willing to? You didn't know you're gonna get cold called. I figured everybody would pick 50, so then I just quickly took three quarters of 50 and came up with 37.5. Yep, so, so Patty put 37.5, um, and in fact, I see quite a few others did, right? So if you take the average of all the random numbers between zero and 100, you get 50, right? Multiply that by three quarters and you get 37.5, and 37 and 38 are the most popular answers that people give. That is pretty much always kind of the most common. I see a couple of people that put 100. Um, I get those occasionally as well. There's two reasons. Now this I often will get from people that I talk to about how to do this more often than I get with students. Usually the 100 are people that just wanna mess with it. So they're like, okay, I don't know how to win this thing. I don't know what the right number is, but I can throw the average off and make it harder for everybody else, and put 100. By the way, I fully encourage that. When I talk to students about what you did, right, I see a couple of other people that put um, numbers on below that. Um, I see, so I usually make people feel really comfortable with their answers by asking questions like, did anybody think about it for a while, didn't feel like it anymore, and just put your birthday or your lucky number, All right? Feel free to throw a yes in the chat if you tossed in a lucky number rather than a carefully calculated one. Did anybody do that? There we go. Okay. And so I ask that. I ask whether anybody kind of misunderstood the game and just didn't really put an answer that they're proud of. I usually do that completely non judgmentally to basically tell them it is completely okay to do whatever you want in these games. In fact, that's going to be a benefit with this one in particular in a second. But here's the key the difference is you really didn't have time to think about this game. So it's really hard to explain kind of how well this works if you're all, if I don't have the chance to give you guys a way to think about it. So yes, absolutely, Amy, that's, that's really it, is I, I joke about myself and I usually will try to find early a couple of people that I know so that I can make fun of them. And I know I, I, I am not one of the types of teachers that say, you know, hey, that's great, I, I'm sarcastic. I mock students, but I first make sure that I know who and that they all know that it's just for fun when we discuss these games, not something I would recommend for everybody, but I always kind of make sure I, I tell them first to make them feel comfortable that everything is okay. So the big issue is you all just had the chance to think about it once. Just even through this discussion, is there anybody that is thinking that you wish you did something different? Okay, that's it. That's the, this is literally all it is. I don't need to have this conversation with you. You will have it all by yourself. Given a day, given a day exactly. So given a day to think about this, people would then say, wait a second. If everybody's gonna put 50 as the average and I put 37, but what if everybody did that? What if everybody else had that same, oh, 50 is the average, so I'm going to go to 37. But then if 50 is the average and I, everybody goes to 37, then to win, I want to go three quarters of that. So I want to go closer to 28. Now, some people are going to drive themselves crazy with that. And they're going to say, oh, but if everybody knows that, I should go times three quarters of 28 and times three quarters of that. And that's going to take it all the way down to zero. But the main thing is that students always show up from this game with, here's what I put, and here's what I wish I put. And that difference between the two is the entire point of what I'm 
generally try to get across that they already in some sense have, that they didn't think about this as far as they should have, and they should apply that to the next thing they see. So what do we do in class? Um, how do I get rid of my annotations? Um, Clear up, there we go. So then in class, I just, I show them the nice thing is by doing this ahead of time, I also have the advantage that I can prepare. So these are the pictures just from the last semester. I can prepare uh, all the pictures. I can also afterwards uh, give them the answer. So by the way, this is last semester. The average number was 40.4, three quarters was 30.3. So what does that mean? It means those, why am I muted? Am I good? I okay. just saw everybody mute. Okay, so those of you that went for 37 will find that what you actually wanna do is go one step beyond that. And so then I'll show them, you know, who won, who did the best, who actually had the best thing. So last semester it was James, we had 28.5, which by the way is exactly kind of what happens if you go three quarters one more time from 37 and a half, right? So kind of reinforces that that's how you win these. And then I show them the farthest. Um, here I make a joke that, you know, I told them that I would name people and what you did, but I, I didn't have the heart to name the person that put 90, although they already identified themselves. So it was kind of a funny moment. They literally, I had two people that put 90 last semester. One said, I just wanted to put a random number that would mess with the average. And one who said, oh, I was really confused. I thought I was supposed to pick a number close to 100. So it's all fine. Um, the reason it's all fine, actually, oh, and then one person picked zero, which is exactly what you should put if you multiply it by three quarters an infinite number of times. Um, here's the fun part. Asking students for a game like that um, and showing that some people made mistakes and some people put their lucky numbers, and yet as a group, we all do the exact same thing. So I show them what happened at UConn the last five years. I can show you the results from Vanderbilt and others. And so this kind of starts us along the way of People are incredibly predictable in groups, but also that we need to think one step ahead. So this silly game, and the reason I say it's silly is they log in, they see a paragraph, and all they need to do is come up with a number. But when I used to do it in class, it was a fun little exercise. When I started to do it a few days before class, they come really excited to know what happened, and they're already doubting their answers. They spend more time talking about why they figured out their answer was wrong before they even see the results than they do about the answer they originally put. And that has completely changed the intuition that I need to teach because then they bought the one step ahead. Then I give them the silly airplane seats and whether kids should be in their own. And now we're completely ready to teach pretty advanced theory all in the name of, now here's how you do it in a more complicated situation. Nothing's gonna change intuition wise. I'm just giving you the math so you can apply this to something bigger. So let me give you one more example. Um, in some of these games, I actually use half of the students to make a point to the other half. So I, I kind of think of this as sacrifice. Um, only half of the students are going to have to do the heavy thinking, but the other half learn by kind of looking at the other half confused. So this is going to be a little tougher to do here. So here's how we're going to have to do this. Normally when the students would play this, they would randomly get one of two roles, which means also they're not really, it's not being made clear to them that there's another role. They know there is, but it's not like this. When you see a split screen and you're kind of conscious of the fact that there's a second role. So to split these, um, let's just say if your first name starts with A to L, you're on the left side, you're the editor of CNN. And if you're M to Z on your first name, you're the right side, you're the editor of the New York Times. And so try to just kind of focus on your side. They're gonna look very similar um, until we get to the fun part. So here it is. This one's a little longer. So you are the editor of CNN or New York Times. You and your largest competitor must decide upon the headline story to feature tomorrow morning. The big stories tonight are a presidential scandal and a proposal for the United States to deploy military forces to Grenada. Each site's ad revenue depend on both headline stories. So a randomly selected person here would be the editor for the other one 
And the choice of that student and your choice will determine your profits. Okay, so that's all the info that they have, that they're making a decision, they're gonna be randomly paired with somebody else, and their job is just to choose between Scandal or Grenada. So now we give you a little more info. The New York Times audience prefers foreign affairs to Scandal, and CNN's audience loves Scandal. However, if you both choose Scandal, customers will visit the New York Times because of their superior infographics. So when deciding on a cover story, neither website editor knows which story the other will choose to run. So you're gonna make a decision just for yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the profits. And you're gonna, if you are on the CNN or New York Times, I want you to think about judging by your decisions and your profits, which one you would do. So specifically, based on your feature story, so you can see there, CNN and New York Times, choose either Scandal or Grenada you receive those advertising revenues where CNN's numbers are first and New York Times is second. So whatever you're the editor of, if you're the editor of CNN, think about whether you wanna run Scandal or Grenada based on the profits that you would make not knowing what New York Times would do. And so take a few seconds and just think about what you would do in whatever role you were in. Yeah, so this is literally the students would log in. This would take them five minutes. They would do this three days before lecture. And they would pick either Grenada or Scandal. And that's literally all they would do. Okay. So I wanna to talk to the CNN folks, All right? So I just, so the New York Times folks can take a little break for a second. I just wanna to talk to the CNN folks. So the CNN folks had a choice of Scandal or Grenada. So let me start with, I guess, Grenada. So is there anybody who was CNN who chose Grenada? Okay. Professor T, please no. Uh, Joe Paris raised their hand, so we will. Okay, so who did? I'm sorry. So anybody that said I did or is willing to say yes, just can we can we hear from whoever? Mary, can we? Yes, yeah. uh, Joe Paris. Yeah, I uh, I went with Grenada as, as uh, it was the only one that gave me a guaranteed profit. With Scandal, I had a chance of uh, getting none or no revenue. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm guessing from all of the other people writing, yes, that that's a pretty common answer, right? And if you are CNN and you stare at this and you see, you know, do you want to make 60 for certain or take a risk between zero and 100? Mm -hmm. It seems like a pretty straightforward answer. But then the question that we start to ask is, the risk that you're taking isn't a coin toss, right? It's not like somebody out there is going to flip a coin and make a decision about which, whether you get zero or 100, the risk that you're taking depends on the decision that's gonna be made by the other party. It depends on what New York Times does. So this is where having half of the class watching the other, New York Times is sitting there quietly. And so what I wanna ask New York Times now is just tell me how long did you spend on your decision? Or on a scale of crazy easy to very hard, how hard was the decision that you had to make if you were New York Times? Yeah, you guys look, crazy easy. The New York Times, the students that log in to play the New York Times role of this game leave a little unhappy. They're like, really? Like, this is what I had to you know, set aside time in my weekend to do? I had to log in to play this ridiculously silly game. And the CNN folks are all staring at my students going, wait, why? And so then you take a look at this entirely from the New York Times perspective. All right. If the New York Times picks scandal, they earn zero or 50. 
If the New York Times picks Grenada, they are an 80 or 100. So if, in a way, you kind of show it in graphs like this, where the New York Times, if they pick scandal, you can see kind of looking down the left column, they're going to earn either 50 or zero, depending on what CNN does. Why would they pick something that gets them a maximum of 50 when they can earn something that gets them a minimum of 80? And so then the question becomes, right, is 60 better than a risk of zero or 100? The way to phrase that is, the risk is, do you trust that another person would take a minimum of 80 over a maximum of 50? And so, Again, when, you, when people first do this, and, and, and this, is, you know, this is a very common thing. In fact, I'll tell you from my own research, I got so excited by this game, I started sticking people into an fMRI machine so to figure out why some people pick Scandal and Grenada, and we're actually seeing that the parts of your brain that worry about risk light up for the people that pick Grenada, and the parts of your brain that are responsible for kind of interpersonal logic relations type thing pick Scandal. That it's completely human, depending on whether we're seeing this as a, as a risk decision or as a kind of logical other person decision. And so the students, however, when they play this ahead of time, this usually strikes them before they come to class. Meaning they come prepared with the understanding that they picked Grenada because it was a risk. And what they really need to do is before CNN makes a decision, they should put themselves in the shoes of the New York Times. That's a, a really easy thing to say. It is an incredibly difficult thing to teach students to do consistently. Meaning what I have found is I can show you a game and say, okay, CNN, think about the New York Times first. Oh yes, they're definitely gonna pick Grenada. Well, if they pick Grenada, you're safe picking Scandal. You can make a hundred, but then I'll show you a different game and you won't do it again. Right? It's very hard for us to get into this rhythm of first thinking about the strategic interaction of others. But when I moved this game to be three days before lecture, I found that no longer challenging. That somehow they've already spent all of this time kicking themselves for making that decision and realizing that the next situation that I give them, they immediately do it. And so in particular, um, what we usually see, by the way, is we see CNN split 50-50. So about half pick Grenada and half pick Scandal. And by the way, those that pick Scandal aren't always doing it um, because of some careful logic about the other. Some of them just say, eh, it's worth the risk. I have a chance at 100. 100 is better than 60. So lots of different reasons. On the New York Times side, almost everybody picks Grenada. Why not everybody? Because some people make mistakes. Some people have better things to do than play this game, and they play it quickly. And some people just like messing with others. So again, then in class, it's fun to talk about what happened. Um, it's fun to I call out the people. So the fact that only 90% pick Grenada means that somebody for the New York Times will pick Scandal. It means that somebody for CNN who picked Scandal will get zero. And so, you know, I'll put their name up on the board and say, you know, you did the right thing. Still sucks. So, you know, that's all kind of part of the debriefing. But the best part is I know exactly how the game went. I am fully ready in class to discuss it. Knowing which student did what has made the discussion so easy. If I need volunteers to talk about what they did and nobody's volunteering a position that I need represented, I can just call on somebody. So that's basically it. And then from there, I go to this complicated situation. How much should United charge for this route? They immediately say, well, hold on a second. Let's take a look at Southwest's profits. I don't have to prompt it anymore. They immediately now think, let's look at the other side. So something that used to take a long time to really get them to internalize, now as soon as I, pr I present the next thing we're gonna do in class, they immediately say, let's take a look at the other side. And so that's really kind of my entire point. Games that are deceptively easy, a single paragraph with a single decision that require very little time seem to encourage the most post-participation reflection. That is a game that students see and say, oh, that's it, that's all I gotta do, is exactly the games that later they go, oh. And that oh makes them think, makes them talk about it to other students, makes them come to class really excited to share what they've learned, and to, in some sense, ask for atonement for their original mistakes. Students come to class already understanding the point of the lecture. 
And so taking the games that you might already use, creating simple new ones, and simple is the key, but simply sticking them well before you approach the material that they're going to be learning is my one trick pony that has served me incredibly well in this and in other classes. So that's what I'm here to share and to take any questions or comments or critiques or thoughts. Thanks, Mike. There was, um, I did have a question from earlier in the chat. Uh, I don't know if this would be in your wheelhouse, but people were asking if you had recommendations for games such as in uh, teaching anatomy, uh, teaching medicine or nursing, or, or just, I think, any subject areas outside of economics. So psychology I've had, um, unfortunately, far from so I'll tell you uh, one that I definitely know in medicine because I know a doctor that's used it is I have a game that explains Bayes rule, um, which I know epidemiologists have a really hard time learning. Um, so, you know, kind of the equivalent of saying, you know, if, if a relative of yours had a particular, uh, had cystic fibrosis, what's the chance that you have it? Um, and, you know, neither one quarter nor one half is correct, nor is three quarters because you have to depend on the fact that, that you're healthy. Um, so I have a few others. I think the easiest things to do is to say, um, if people have specific questions, just email me um, and I will try to figure out which of the games that I've used or whatever might have an application. Because um, I know some of them have been borrowed and used in others. Um, so it's kind of hard to answer. But medicine is probably the hardest. I only know of one um, that I've used. Hardest just in terms of my knowledge. Um, for industries and law, the answer is absolutely. So a lot of these, so first of all, I've, I've taught lawyers um, in the past and I've taught business executives when I used to teach MBAs and they would farm me out to do these executive seminars. I used a lot of these games. Um, at first they were kind of hesitant saying, but they're not business games. But again, um, tying it into that, oh, my email, it's right above me. Um, my hand disappears, but it's over my, uh, over my shoulder. Um, oh no, that's my Twitter. Uh, my email is mike at mikeshore.com is the easiest to remember or mike.shore at uconn.ed. Either one of those. So as so I said, out, outside of the social sciences, um, so within the social sciences, political science, uh, certainly psychology, absolutely, law, absolutely. Outside of those, I'd have to do a little bit more thinking, um, but I'm happy to try. So any other thoughts, questions? Well, if there's no more questions, oh, then we can wrap things up. Thank you, Mike, so much for this presentation. I know I had a lot of fun playing these games and questioning everything I do. So I hope everyone else did as well. Um, we really want to thank you for, for joining us. And if everyone is still up for it, I know it's late for some of you. We do have some happy hours going on tonight. We'd love to see you, but we also appreciate how much time you've given to these three days. So have a wonderful night and we hope to be in touch with you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And do please email. <laughs>